She just stands there. And she's the same as you or me or anybody else. She's solid. And you just open your eyes and she's there. You know, it's not in the mind, it's you do see her. And if she touches you, you would feel her. She is solid. So I'm asking her if she would just backtrack in her memory to the events around her death. She died in great agony. This is the village of Ingotston in Essex in southeastern England. It's a village that lies on the old coaching route from London to Colchester. And it's a place that has been somehow bypassed by all the industrial developments around it. Much of it looks very much as it did three or even 400 years ago. And in our researches around the country, we found that places that have a long and involved history like this do seem to have a sort of multi-layered history of psychic events, almost as if the events that the building has lived through are in some way imprinted upon its fabric. This building, for example, was built in Elizabethan times. It was an old coaching inn for almost 300 years. Then in Victorian times, it became a bakery. Now it's a restaurant and a bakery. And many of the people who work here have no doubt They've seen and experienced things they can't possibly explain. As I'm walking out to the table, I feel like someone's looking at me, and it feels quite cold. So I've looked up, and there's a lady standing there, and she's looking at me. She was quite short, I think, but it was, it was quite quick, um, and it was fairly dark as well, but her face was really, really white, very, very pale. She didn't have what you could say would hair. You didn't have sort of like a bun and you couldn't really see it. Um, and she was, had a taffetary type black dress on. And uh, as I walked to get the book, she turned and walked through the, the wall. I, was, I went to serve um, this person and I saw this lady walk past in a black dress. But I knew it was just me and these people in, in the restaurant. We weren't busy. And, no one else appeared to have seen her, but it was like there was an, another person. It wasn't, you know, people saying, oh, ghostly figs. Or it's nothing like that. It was just like a real person. I was just working in the, uh, the office one afternoon and uh, not expecting it at all. Um, I was sitting there concentrating what I had to do for the following, following week, getting all my records ready, and basically I could feel all the hairs on my neck stand up. Um, I could feel it rub the back of my neck and it was very quiet, and I could hear the main road from my office. It's on the side up the oak. You can hear like cars going past, and I couldn't hear a single car. It's like I could hear a pin drop. I felt that when I, I shook it off, and I just got up and went to the toilet. It was a natural thing to do, as you would, and uh, I went through, and I, I sighted the woman behind the lady's toilet door, and she sort of looked at me and sort of drifted behind the door. Uh, and I, first of all, I stood in shock, wondering what that could be, because I, I thought I was the only one on the, in the building. And uh, I followed it through the back of the door, and there's nothing there. There's absolutely no one there at all. The Victorian lady most often appears upstairs. Downstairs, in the oldest part of the house, there has been a continuous series of strange events, mainly poltergeist activity, things moving around, loud footsteps across a wooden floor that everybody knows is now carpeted. The sort of thing that makes you doubt your own judgment until you realize that several other people have experienced exactly the same sort of thing. And there was uh, four of us downstairs and we were all talking and we were standing by this fridge and it's a tall fridge and the fridge actually moved about three inches and we all stood there and watched this fridge moving, we just couldn't believe it. And it took two chefs to move the fridge back. To sort of lock up we go through everything by system whereby I would turn all the lights off in here and then I have to walk through the lounge, or what's now known as the Macron's room, was our sort of staff lounge at the time. Um, and what the light switch was only on one side of the wall. Now, as there are doors either side of the, the room, I had to walk through, through the dark, to the other side of the room to turn the light on. And as I approached the door on the other side of the room, in the pitch black, I felt a hand 
round my elbow. I actually felt the fingers like this around my elbow. I presumed it was someone in the room trying to play some sort of joke on me. Um, but I was right by the door and the light switch at the time, so I turned the light on and there was no one in the room with me. At the back of the house is the bakery, and several people have seen here in great detail in terms of dress and facial expression and so on, the figure of a baker who actually died here of a heart attack several years ago. I was teaching one of my trainees um, how to make a salad, and this was about two o'clock in the morning. We've just done a lot of building work in the front part of the uh, building, which is now a restaurant. And uh, I'd s had this chap standing near me and uh, I obviously wasn't surprised to see him. I just presumed he'd come through for some milk or something for him in the evening because uh, there was no refrigeration in that part of the bakery. And uh, he, he ignored me as I talked to him and uh, I was c carrying on concentrating doing my salads and uh, I turned around. It was very clear, that it was very clear as if it was a human being talking to me about five feet away. Uh, and I, at this point I didn't realise I'd sighted something that was the paranormal. I had, uh, he had a white t-shirt on, he was very dusty with flour, um, sort of dark hair, uh, curly, brown, and uh, he'd sort of had a, a brown belt on that was hanging down, uh, as most of the bakers seem to wear with white trousers and black, black sort of shoes that looks like I've been worn for the last 40 years, you know, with flour all over them. Um, uh, and uh, he, he ignored me, so as I was concentrating on this commie chef, he had turned around as we talked to him the second time, and uh, I just said, have you got your milk for the evening, uh, for your tea or something, and carried on getting this young lad to concentrate on what he was doing. And he ignored me again. As I turned around myself for the third time, he had disappeared, so I presume he was just being arrogant, ignorant or whatever, and he, he just didn't want to know what I was saying or just came to have a look and went. I obviously did nothing. So I went to see the night baker, who had only just come in uh, in the evening of the bakery, and uh, said, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to ignore me, you know, I'm, out, you know, I'm here to help you. We're supposed to get on, we work as a team, it's a business we're running. And uh, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, you know, you've just been round there, I've spoke to you three times, you've ignored me. He says, that door in the bakery there, he said, I've been here 13 and a half years, I've never been through that door. And with that, a startling sort of effect and feeling on me, uh, which was quite horrible. <laughs> um, and he said that you would probably seen a ghost, which he'd not sighted himself, but uh, he said he'd heard many stories over the years he'd been there. I glimpsed out of the corner of my eye um, a man standing in the ladies' toilets. Now, he was in front of a full-length mirror, and he was wearing a white jacket. It looked like white trousers, um, and I only saw the back of him, dark-haired chap, um, and at the time I thought it was just a chef um, sort of getting ready for work and you know having a check in the mirror um, so I didn't really study him too closely it wasn't what I was expecting but I, I looked away and sort of went to busy myself and uh, suddenly thought well why is it why is the chef in the ladies toilets when they've got, got their own staff room and you know the men's why was he in there so I looked back and all I saw was my own reflection, and I looked back. Events like this have been going on for several years now. And although nobody talked about them very much, they became an acknowledged part of the atmosphere of the place. And then one day, Mandy, the manageress, went to see a friend who had some experience as a psychic medium, and was told to her surprise about some of the spirits or entities whom the medium claimed still inhabited the old coaching inn. I went to see this, this lady, it was for fun, just fortune telling and things like that, so we went there. And then she actually told me that where I worked, it was haunted and there was this young girl here. And she described the building and she actually told me that she watched me leave. And uh, I asked her why it was, it was such a, a scary experience. So she said, it's because she doesn't want you to leave the building, she doesn't want to be there on her own, but she does actually watch you leave. And she even described how I got, I, I get in my car and I speed up the road. Um, she also said um, there is a, a soldier here, and but he's he isn't he isn't nice. Where this young girl is is nice. She likes to be here. This soldier, um, he doesn't like it here at all. Doesn't like to be here at all. And she said, you know, that's that is not good. 
Eventually, Diane the medium decided to go back to Ingerston to see if she could learn more about this person whom she called Sarah, who seemed to have been a maid or a servant at the old inn, perhaps 200 or more years ago. The first time Sarah, I saw Sarah, she was in long clothes. It was a skirt and top, I think, and it was made of dark sacking stuff with a shawl. Um, over her head or round her shoulders. But the second, no, the third time I saw Sarah, she had a bonnet, which was her mother's. And Sarah said that she's wearing this bonnet because it's a um, special occasion. And she's very happy, so she's dressed up in her mother's bonnet. Then we went through the house. This was a nice room. She liked this room. There's one room upstairs she didn't like because she broke her arm and she used to have to nurse the sick in that room. And um, then there's another room, she always watches Mandy go home safely. That's what I call Sarah's room. And then she just showed us all, but it was as it was, not as it is now. A servant girl, a soldier, a Victorian lady, and a baker, all from quite different periods in history. The accounts of some of the events in the old coaching inn at Ingotston were so intriguing they seem to have been recorded in such detail that we decided to bring in another psychic medium to see if any of his perceptions match the descriptions we'd received. Eddie Burks has an international reputation for his work in this field. And we took him to the house blind, so to speak. We told him nothing about its history or what was said to have gone on there. And the extraordinary fact is that within a few minutes of his arrival at the house, he felt as if he'd been seized upon by someone unseen. As he described her, the similarity to the young maid servant Sarah was unmistakable. I think she was um, a serving girl. I'm seeing her wearing um, an apron. And um, a white, white apron and a white bonnet, which I'm not quite sure that it's it's not a mob cap, but it served the uh, same purpose as a mob cap. Um, kept the hair in order. Um, part of her uniform, as it were. She's wearing a, a skirt which comes down to upper ankles. It's not a full length skirt. Um, I think it's a brownish, a brown, fairly coarse cloth. The apron is fastened over it. But she had lots of hair, and I think the colour was brown. From what I can see of it, anyway. This strange conversation, well, that is what it felt like, went on for over half an hour and it seemed that the servant girl was increasingly unwilling to talk about her death or why she felt trapped. She knows I want her to go back into um, the reasons why she's stuck, um, which means going back perhaps into her death situation. Oh, no wonder she backed out of it. Uh, It's to do with um, childbirth that went wrong. Oh, she died in great agony. <clears throat> Possibly a breech birth that couldn't be dealt with properly, but she died, and her thoughts are about the child, my child, my baby, my baby. <clears throat> great grief allied with um, the memory of great pain, terrible pain, clumsy midwife.
After that very disturbing experience, Eddie moved around the house for a while and then made what he claimed was another contact in the part of the house where there had been so much poltergeist activity, the strange sounds and the unexplained movements. The contact seemed to be, he said, of a young man, a former soldier, filled with anger. I'm seeing a, a man in... Um... in Kharki, First World War set, soldier. <clears throat> he was, he was either married or engaged to a girl. He was, oof. He was killed in, in France. As soon as he died, he very swiftly came back here, <clears throat> drawn by the need to contact this young woman. And what he found sort of destroyed him. He was involved in some way with someone else. There's a lot of energy there with him, and a lot of frustration, and a determination to make himself felt. So it seemed that the two mediums had, quite independently, at quite different times, encountered the same spirits or entities. That in itself is quite remarkable. But how are we supposed to respond when we witness Eddie's conversations? Here we have a man who is clearly sane and reasonable and of great integrity, claiming to have detailed and intimate communication with people who lived and died 80, 100, even 200 years ago. And not only talking, but sharing in crucial moments in their lives. How does Eddie explain what he believes is going on? Um, some people, some ghosts are attached to places very specifically. Others tend to be attached to localities. Some as it were, are adrift. And occasionally I'll pick up the ones that are adrift. I, I sometimes think that if you're psychic, you do tend to show some degree of illumination in the next level, especially in the etheric level where these people are, tra are trapped. And that will draw them to, they know intuitively perhaps, that, that there possibly is some, some help available. The world they live in is a gloomy, dark one and therefore a small light will be a, an attraction. But Eddie's claims go further. He believes that when he goes into an old building like this one, that has a long and involved multi-layered history, it's possible for him, as it were, to go back through time and peel off the various layers of the building's psychic history. Imprints occur, they're occurring all the time, in every building, in every place, and they are, the, um, they are the result, very largely, of the emotional content of events. And the, more, the stronger the emotion, the more, the more deeply these are etched into this record of, of the place. And I sometimes think that if, you're, if I go into a place and I deliberately start looking for the imprint aspect, which is very different from going in and looking for the a haunting aspect, but if I'm looking for the imprint, I feel as though I'm peeling the wallpaper off a very old building, and I'll get an imprint of something more recent, followed by an imprint of something further back, and so on. The fundamental question, of course, is what kind of conclusions can we draw from the research we've carried out on this programme, indeed on this series? From the sheer range of events that we've looked into, the number, of reliable witnesses we've interviewed and the quality of the historical verification, it would be very difficult indeed to challenge the claims that paranormal events have taken place. But it's just as clear there is nothing that could be called conventional scientific proof, nothing that could be weighed or measured or repeated in a controlled environment. But that does not mean, of course, that they didn't take place. 
there is, we think, clear evidence of a profound shift in the scientific community, away from an outright rejection of paranormal activity towards an acceptance that it lies beyond the bounds of scientific method and may well require a totally different scientific approach if we are to come to any deeper understanding of what is really going on. My own philosophy is rather dualistic. I think there are one set of laws for the mind and another set for matter and... Uh, 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 and that um, uh, what, what science knows uh, to, to, to a very advanced degree are the laws that govern the behaviour of matter and perhaps the laws that govern the behaviour even of the brain. But uh, over and above all that, I believe mind is a power in the universe and that mind can uh, uh, achieve things that are simply not allowed for in the accepted scientific uh, scheme, which is basically a physicalistic uh, picture of reality. My own view is that psychical phenomena, even if you believe that the probability that they are real is, is very small, their significance will be so immense, if demonstrated to be valid, that it's crucial that we should try and investigate them. I really wish we knew more about these cases. In fact, it's part of the reason why one studies psychic phenomena, in order to gather as many cases as possible so that they can be compared. Every science begins with the stamp collecting stage where you, you collect all kinds of stamps. You have no preconceived notions about where they come from or why they are printed in such colors or what the denominations are. But once you've got a large number of them, then you can compare them. You begin to classify them. You begin to see family resemblances. You begin to get some theory about why stamps exist, where they go, where they come from, why they have such denominations. You are beginning to get beyond the stamp collecting stage. And this happens with every science. And I hope we are beginning to get beyond the stamp collecting stage with psychic phenomena, but I sometimes have my doubts. But that these phenomena are real, I have no doubt whatsoever. Mm -hmm.